Kelly just warned me that this mic was on and I was screaming. I just need you to know that to hear you talking to each other is a joyful noise to God. I am not. I'm actually encouraging you to talk some more.
Good morning and welcome. Welcome, welcome. We are so thankful that all of you are here. And um, we are thankful for all our guests who are joining us both in person and online. Um, prayer requests can be submitted um, through the Facebook Live uh, feed until the end of the sermon. Um, so please be aware of that. Uh, we have many opportunities to serve. Um, the Finance Committee, the Stewardship Committee, Endowment, Outreach, Trustees, uh, United Methodist Men, and Web Maintenance. Um, and, um, of course, the Sunday School te uh, program, as always, needs loving adult volunteers to share the love of God with children. Uh, and we are also looking for a new coordinator for children's ministries. If you are interested or know of someone who might be, please uh, see me after worship. Also, um, the green sales uh, are uh, active now. And Jerry Thomas, who's sitting in the back there, uh, has uh, forms. We need those uh, order forms by next Sunday. But the greens, this is another thing we get to bring back and do uh, to celebrate our holy times. And, and Jer thank you, Jerry has forms and can answer all your questions and all of that. So um, please, if you are interested, see Jerry. It's a great thing. Um, I believe uh, the only other announcement is just simply to say that Pastor Anthony is not here today because he was in close proximity with someone who later tested positive for COVID. He is well, um, but they have asked him to isolate uh, for a certain number of days. I'm not sure how many. I feel certain he will be back uh, next week, 10 days, you think. Um, he will be here next week, so uh, please keep him in your prayers as well. And now, I'm going to invite you to share in our opening hymn. It's in the United Methodist Hymnal, number 572, Pass It On.
Good morning, and please join with me in the opening prayer. God, who has created all things, you are welcome in this place. Jesus, who saved us through Calvary's cross, you are welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, who offers us divine direction, you are welcome in this place. Triune God, with no beginning and no end, you are welcome in this place. Dwell with us, O God, as we offer your heartfelt worship and unending praise. Hear our prayer, O God. Amen. Today's scripture lesson is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Then they arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes and did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it has seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. But Jesus then asked him, what is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on a hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then the people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God had done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The word of God for the people of God.
not quite sure how to follow that. So our time together uh, as children, I invite you, this is the last in our series about the gentleman in the windows. But the most important lesson also um, comes with who we're going to learn about today. So God loves me all the time. God loves me all the time. Today we're learning a little bit about John Wesley, the guy in the purple. Now, as a United Methodist pastor, I've studied a lot about him, and one of the reasons uh, he's the fourth is that I got stuck in all I knew in my head about John Wesley, and that just is a lot and kind of complicated and really not very children's moment. And Pastor Anthony helped me with that. He said, well, talk about prevenient grace. And I thought, that is John Wesley's thing. Why didn't I think of that? Now, that's a big word. It means going before or all around, prevenient, always. That's really the lesson we just relearned, that God is around us all the time. And that was Wesley's big thing. And frankly, it was pretty revolutionary in his time that God is loving, caring, that the grace and love of God is around us no matter what. And that God loves us always, everywhere, all the time. And so I did bring one illustration that um, a sister church has been using and passing out to people. It's another way of saying our cheer. But this is uh, from Royal Oak. First, I'm, I'm going to put it in front of my face because I'm assuming you're streaming my face. <clears throat> God loves you and there is nothing you can do about it. That's a modern version of prevenient grace, of John Wesley's most important and greatest lesson. And so as you come to worship in this place, I invite you to think about the lessons we've learned that these gentlemen taught us throughout history to remember that God loves us no matter what, and there's nothing we can do to make that stop. So God's blessings on each of you and know that you are each and all beloved and blessed children of God. And now I get to uh, lead us in celebrating some really strong leaders in our congregation who have led our children through Christian education. Well, children and adults, actually. We all need to learn, right? And so um, it occurred to me that I, my plan is to call everyone up. I'm going to invite you to mask if you can. Um, but I'd like you to, to come forward as I call your name if you're present with us. And if you are watching uh, online, I invite you to know that you are being named and thanked for all that you have done. And after I invite each of those people forward, I'm going to invite us to offer a prayer or a responsive prayer of thanksgiving for their service. So... Let's begin. I guess I need that little mic. Well, no. Let's. So I'm going to name everyone. And please know that some folks aren't able to be here. Um, but I think it's important for us to know that they have contributed so much um, to each and to all of us in this congregation. So I begin with Jody and Pat Imus, who for years and years led our guiding force youth group. We are so grateful for all of their leadership. Uh, Nora Mason. Is Nora here? Come on up. Kathleen Miska. I don't believe Kathleen's here. Sharon Jesse. Joan Pence. I know Joan's here. Maggie and Ben Nemec, come on up. Terry Mock, Jim Mock, Paula Mullen. Paula's not here, I think. Amy Berry, Amy Moore. Yeah, 
Look at this. We may not have room for everybody. Imagine that. Karen Bridgeford. Barbara Walker. Yay. Reverend Carolyn Wick. I know she's watching. Doug, uh, your, uh, Kelly, I, your sign language, what does that mean? Oh, okay. Back up onto the chancel. <laughs> uh, well, I had a plan. <laughs> okay. Doug Tonkovich, where's Doug? I know he's here. Dan Mullen. Look at this. Marilyn Totten. Jackie. Leah Schroeder. I don't believe Leah's here. Yeah, she's actually she, doing She wasn't a minute ago. Uh, Andrea Schroeder is, uh, told me she would not be here, unfortunately. Rachel Krieger. Beth Schultz. Pat Bradley. Mike Moore. AJ Phillips. Mark Phillips. Judy Phillips. Robert Cook, I know Bob's going to be here next week. Jane Hunter and Dave Drake. Okay, so I'm going to lead us in this liturgy that should responsibly be seen on the screen. And Jackie's not up here because she's making that happen, so please know she's doing double duty or triple or what. Edwin, please. Edwin, please, please forgive me. So, okay, I'm, I'm, this is the human, human in me making mistakes. So will you share with me in thanking all of these people? Gracious God, we give you thanks for each of these blessed leaders who have responded to the call of God to become servants in our Christian education program. You have entrusted them with the message of your power, grace, justice, and love. You have provided your guidance, support, and wisdom so that they might share your loving grace in our midst. For those who have served hearing God's call to teach, lead, assist, and mentor, we say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you have <clears throat> trusted in God's promises to support, sustain, and encourage you through gifts sufficient for your task. And we say, thank you, thank you, thank you. You have assisted our children and youth, relying on the presence of the Holy Spirit to grant you wisdom. And we say, thank you, thank you, thank you. You have invited our children and youth to recognize and respond to God's call in their lives, and we say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. I'm going to invite you, um, Jackie, this one's yours. And when somehow I have misplaced your certificate, I'm so sorry. So let me pass out these certificates. It's a little awkward here, but Marilyn.
Amen. I'm with her. Okay, now if I can. There it is. Thank you all so much for all you've done. And now I'm going to invite us, if this is an important moment, to sing. So this wonderful hymn, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. It's in your, the faith we sing, number 2158. 2158 in the faith we sing. invite you into a moment of prayer. Gracious and always loving God, we seek your blessing on this time of sharing. Please, God, bless these words that they might be heard and that our communication with each other and with you might be faithful and fruitful and loving in your sight. Amen. Some of you know that I began my time in ordained ministry at Cass Church downtown. I was the associate youth pastor. It was an amazing time of growth for me 
I learned so much. It was a number of years ago when massive floods ravaged the midsection of our nation. I remember that almost every single night the TV news aired horrible pictures of swollen rivers and waterways of entire neighborhoods underwater, of boats motoring past roofs of houses, of families left homeless, even of people who had died as a result of that flooding. It was not unlike much of what we have seen in our own state this year, but this was a long time ago. In response to the needs that were created by that natural disaster, what was then the Detroit East District, we've changed our organization more than once, but back then I was director of the Detroit East District Council on Youth Ministries. We planned a mission work trip to Des Moines and to Nevada, Iowa. 27 youth and adults from CAS and Metropolitan Churches in Detroit, from Central Church in Waterford and First Churches in Troy and Royal Oak, we set out late one Sunday evening for Iowa. <laughs> we were hauling lots of clean water, hygiene supplies, cleaning supplies, tools, general work gear like boots and gloves. We drove all night, arriving in Des Moines for lunch. After lunch, we went to a relief center and delivered our supplies. And then we headed toward Nevada, where we had a, a ministry connection with one of the pastors. We were going to stay there. We got there about five in the afternoon. By this time, we had been traveling for 20 hours and we were all exhausted. The plan for dinner was to give each of the participants some money and send them to the county fair for several of those hours that they could stretch their legs after having been cooped up in those vans for so long. It turned out to be a beautiful Midwestern evening, perfect for an outing to the county fair. I'm going to stop for just a second. I realize in all the award giving, we didn't release children to Sunday school. Did they go? Okay. My apologies. <laughs> Anyhow, so we sent these kids off to the county fair to get some dinner and have a good time. The three primary adult leaders stayed at the church to make housing assignments and work out the logistics for the rest of the week. So I didn't go to the fair. We didn't think much about this because some adults were going and the fair was within easy walking distance of the church. What could go wrong? <laughs> Not too long before the time we were expecting everyone back, a small group of the youth from Cass Church walked into the narthex of the Nevada church and I could tell something was really wrong. As I walked up to the group, I discovered um, one of the young men from Cass was crying. So I embraced him and began to ask questions of him and the rest of the group in an attempt to discern, discern what had happened. Well, it seems that this African-American young man from the city had been fascinated by being so close to a sheep. For the first time, he was fascinated by this animal. He'd never seen anything like it. And so he approached that sheep and began to stroke its wool. Someone even reported that he had tried to hug the sheep. Apparently, the ship he picked, picked was a prize of some kind that belonged to a 4-H member who took particular exception to having his sheep touched, let alone hugged especially by someone who looked so foreign as this one from Detroit. Hmm. Unfortunately, the way that the young man from Iowa expressed his concern for his property was with violently hostile, racially abusive language and aggressive behavior. He said things and used names I would not share here from this pulpit, no matter how true they were. 
Fortunately, even though the young man from Cass was ready to enter the fight and the young man, man from Iowa was trying to start it, cooler heads and larger bodies prevail. No fists were thrown. Thank God. But as a group, we spent a lot of time talking about this incident and celebrating the appropriateness of the nonviolent response. We began to ask the now or then popular question, what would Jesus have done? What did Jesus do, as Pastor Anthony asks? Many of the youth from Michigan objected to the way things had turned out. They would have, and quite easily could have, beaten the 4-H youth up. <laughs> but I kept saying, but, but what would Jesus do? What did Jesus do? In my translation for our lesson from the Gospel according to Luke, Jesus and the disciples arrive in the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite from Galilee. You may remember that this story follows Jesus and the storm on the sea. The storm where he had fallen asleep and the disciples were afraid and he finally woke up and literally walked on water and calmed that sea. Galilee and Gerasa were as different as Detroit and rural Iowa. Maybe as different as those on either side of Eight Mile. Where we had landed, they landed, we landed, both after a violent storm which had directed our course to the opposite place. In each version of the story, the Sea of Galilee represents the deep ethnic racial and cultural alienation that existed between Jesus' world, excuse me, between the Jews' world and the Gentiles' world. This sea, which is actually very small, probably smaller than Lake St. Clair, I've been on it, you can see across it, better than you can see across Lake St. Clair. It, but it was a chasm between the worlds, again, like Eight Mile, between the city and the suburbs in metropolitan Detroit. Though this incident in the Nevada County Fair in Iowa <clears throat> helped us encounter a demon of proportions far bigger than the Roman legions of Luke's gospel, we encountered those demons of isolationism and provincialism, yes, and the demon of racism, which of course is not limited in scope to rural Iowa, look outside. It was a painful encounter. We all shed many tears, and I'm sure that those young ones taught me far more about myself and about the world into which I had been called than I taught them that week. And as difficult as this encounter was, we also encountered Christ. We encountered Christ in each other and in all of our host families and friends, and they encountered Christ in us. When I remember the events of that trip, I'm led back to this scripture and the image of Jesus calming that storm in the chasm that is the Sea of Galilee and in, in taking those demons from that demoniac and putting them in a way that destroyed them, to put them in those swine and destroy those demons. I am grateful that God worked through us to prevent violent responses and that the youth for whom I was responsible learned to lean on each other and to trust God. Still, I see Jesus calming the storms that rage within our souls and on our streets, whenever we cross the chasms that exist in our own area and in our neighborhoods. If we can trust in Christ to be at our sides in the middle of these storms, perhaps, perhaps, we can find the courage to enter more boats that row across more chasms. I pray. As I think about that week, I'm also drawn to the image of Christ's healing love to Christ loving that demoniac no matter what, even while sending the demons to drown. I know, as I knew then, 
that the individual, that that individual young man who had been so possessive about that sheep and the young men who had traveled from far away Michigan were not the demons. They were not. As the Rogers and Hammerstein show tune says, you have to be carefully taught to hate. Still, our presence in that place offered us a moment to share the good news of God's unconditional love. First, we had to name and acknowledge the demons. And the demons had to see and know Christian love and then we could trust in the healing power of Christ to begin the slow, painful process of exercising and drowning the demons within us all. And so it seems to me that the message of the gospel for this morning is, as always, first and foremost, the calming, peace-bearing, healing presence of God through Christ. The reminder that God's limitless, unconditional loving is always with us and all of us, no matter what storms trouble the waters of our lives, that doesn't matter. God is always with us through Christ, no matter what demons possess our souls. And the call of the gospel lesson is that because this absolutely unconditional love of God is available to us all the time, Christ calls us to take the risks of crossing our own seas of Galilee, whatever they are. Furthermore, Christ calls us to trust in this love from God so deeply that we can give names to our own demons and be free of them. It is what God wants for each and for all of us. Many of you know that we are working to create a vision for this congregation. One of the images I will bring to this effort is the powerful spirit many of you offer to me every single time you gather. That is the vision of becoming a congregation where the city and the suburbs come together and everyone's gifts are honored and blessed. In order to become that vision, we will have to take seriously the message and the call of this lesson. The message that even when we are possessed by the most horrible demons, we are loved by God and so is everyone else. In fact, we are so beloved that we can trust God as we take the risk of crossing our own seas, whatever they are, and we can name our own demons and be free of them once and for all time. May it ever be so in the name of Christ. And now, Jerry, our time of offering has arrived. As we have come to our moment of offering, please know that your church is ever so grateful for your prayers and your financial support of our church and its ministries. Thank you. And there are many ways we can support our church with our tithes and offerings. You may mail in or drop off a contribution to our address, 33112 Grand River, Farmington, 48336. You may use PayPal and direct your contribution to First United Methodist Church of Farmington. And you can also text by, to give by texting F-U-M-C GIVE to 44321 and follow the props. Will you pray with me? Dear Jesus, you commanded us to render to Caesar the things are to Caesar's, but to God the things that are God's. So please bless these offerings that we give cheerfully, joyfully, and with the confidence that you will use them for your holy purpose. Amen.
time has come for us to pray together, and we have much to pray for. I was just checking to make sure I hadn't missed any prayer requests on the feed. I don't think I did, but if someone else would check too, I'd sure appreciate it. <sighs> much in our world to pray for. The illness, our COVID emergency, the pandemic, the confusion and the uncertainty caused by all of that. The crisis in Afghanistan and in Haiti, those affected by weather all over the world, wildfires and floods and so much more. For our healthcare workers and our teachers, for Matthew Walters and Nicholas Walters, for William Morrison, for those who have been ill and are recovering, Ken Berry, Pat Shuffler, Patty Morrison, Paul King, Braden Smith, and Nina Smith. For those who are uh, ill, who have health concerns, Ann St. John, Andrea Schroeder, Reverend Sharon Scott, Carmen Houston, Opal Sherman, John Welch, Otto Mildred and Edna Tyson, Harry Ellis, Reverend Nancy Frank, Elizabeth Bartram, Sue Jackson, Terry Shuffler, Brian Lim, Alexander Fraser. COVID-19 concerns for Reverend Tom Waller and his family. Those who are struggling with cancer, Silas Trupiano, Aidan McLaren, Danielle Maj, Jerry Baum, Sam Johnston, Bill and Marge Johnson, Dottie Bradley, Thomas Lee, Raina Edwards, and her grandfather. And for those who grieve, especially the loss of a family member or close friend. The families of Nadine Moses, the Reverend Tom Tartley, Tarpley, excuse me, Leon Jefferson, George Dante Crane, Pastors Nath and Che, Reverend Dr. Barbara Lewis Lakin, and all those who grieve because of tragic means, including all the victims of mass shootings. Will you be in a moment of prayer with me? Gracious and always loving God, we come to you this day with much on our hearts. We lift all of those we have named, those we hold in our hearts, and those about whom we may not be aware of their struggles. Gracious God, embrace each one. Rock them in your loving care, that whether we have named them or hold them in our hearts silently, they might know your ever-present love and care, your healing touch, your warmth and goodness. Be with each of us this day, no matter what the struggles might be. Help us to remember our celebrations and to follow in your path. Be with us now as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught so very long ago. Our Father, Holy is your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now that we might follow, let us share together in this wonderful hymn, Where He Leads Me. It's in the United Methodist Hymnal, number 338.
And now, as we leave this place, go with God's blessings into this wonderful sunny day. Have a blessed celebration today. Have fun and celebrate all that the traditions of this holiday bring. But go mostly with God's blessing, knowing that indeed you are a blessing from God, a beloved gift to God. And having been blessed and gifted in this way, be a blessing to others in the name of Christ. Go in Christ and have a wonderful day. Amen.